Hello traders, welcome to a new week of trading. My name is John Kicklider, I'm Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Sorry for the late start, I actually opened up uh, incorrectly in the education room. But I'm here to discuss with you the week's fundamentals, what we should really be paying attention to in the week ahead, what can really move the markets, as well as what can move the markets over the past, uh, or what has moved the markets over the past week, because you have to know where you've been if you want to know where you're going. But we have a lot more event risk in the coming week, and certainly some high-profile pieces of event risk that can tap into the bigger fundamental themes, the themes that we need to be looking at for market movement. But before I go into that, please tell me if you can see and hear. You should be looking at the pound yen, although I'll probably put it up here to the euro USD because that's where most of our action is going to come through. All right, looks like we're good to go. Excellent. Now, there, if we had to make a comparison to what we had last week versus what we had this week, all right, I don't want to stretch our expectations for market movement trend development. Those are the types of things that we really look for uh, when we're traders, whether we are short-term, medium-term, or long-term traders. We need some level of volatility, and we need some level of trend. Those two things have been uh, absent for some time. Uh, though we have had volatility, it really hasn't been in the... It hasn't been the type that really has lent itself to a consistent direction. That has caused a lot of frustration, uh, especially if you're, let's say, a Euro USD trader, where you had this break to the downside and completely reversed itself in the past week. That was certainly data derived. We'll talk about what that and what did that, and what's probably going to give us similar moves this week. But you could also say the same of the S&P 500. A big uh, positive move, a big technical break when you had that move above 1850, but a complete lack of follow through. It gets above that boundary, stalls, and now as you can see opening up on the first of this new month, the first trading day at least, you've had a big decline. Noteworthy that uh, the first trading days of the past two months have opened up on significant declines as well at least compared to what the price action was prior to it. So, interesting little seasonality effect, uh, a minor seasonality effect potentially uh, developing there. Something to keep in mind, but what I want to look at from the S&P 500 is the constant uh, congestion. And in this constant congestion, we've had a lot of short-term volatility bursts. We've had uh, short-term breaks. You saw we were talking about this one pretty, uh, pretty closely, or following it pretty closely when it was occurring. All right, mid-February, really tight congestion. Those types of uh, candles typically suggest an, an uh, interim breakout. Definitely did get a breakout. Moved to the downside, but it was checked almost immediately. Now this past week, we had a break above 1850, and then what happens to start this week? Checked immediately. These are this is what you see when you get volatility without a common sense of direction. All right? You get technical breaks, breaks that oftentimes traders will jump on because they would originally or presume that this is going to lead to a nice trend after breaking their boundaries. But if you don't have the drive, the momentum to feed that move, it turns into these false breaks and returns back to congestion. So just like the initial move to the upside has failed for follow-through, do not be too uh, ready to jump on a short side move on this break to the downside because it is reflective of the underlying conditions that show that we just cannot find support for momentum one way or the other. All right, this is a very important fundamental and market uh, condition backdrop that defines the markets that we are dealing with. If we have a trend-based strategy, it might be better to uh, put that on hiatus, maybe adopt one that is a little bit more short-term market moving, uh, look for small volatility events, or perhaps we just wait uh, to see the big move uh, and stay on the sidelines. All right. We choose one of those two uh, conditions. We have, to, we have to adapt to the markets that we're presented with. And these are the types of markets we're presented with currently. Now, S&P 500 represents one of the two big themes that I am always talking about. And this one, obviously, is risk trends. 
Now, we've been talking about restrictions on a weekly basis, as we should, because when this starts moving, this will drown out all other fundamental considerations, and you will see uh, pairs, whether we're talking about direct risk-based pairs like the yen crosses, pound yen I'm looking at very closely, whether we're talking about ones that are a little bit further up the curve, unusual, but still tracking out risk, euro, Aussie, whether we are looking at the majors, uh, ones that have uh, seemed to forsaken their risk banner, but would certainly pick it back up on a strong risk-based move like Aussie USD, or even the most liquid and most resilient to those traditional risk trends, Euro USD. Right. These are good measures, and I just took you up the scale of what drives the, you know, the, of their sensitivity to risk trends. This is why I constantly show this now in the videos, the risk sensitivity curve. All right. Because when we see that emerging markets are moving on risk, when we see that yen crosses are moving on risk, when we see that equities are moving on risk, and then pound dollar, then euro dollar, when all of these are moving on a, in a risk way, all right, if you watch football, and uh, U.S. football, we call it, if they make a football move after they catch the ball, all right, if the markets make a risk move, all right, and they're all following a risk uh, direction, whether it be for the dollar, a safe haven move, whether it be for the euro, a risky currency move, fund the pound, a risky, uh, risky based currency pay, uh, currency move, emerging markets obviously, yen crosses obviously, equities obviously declining. If they're all doing that same thing and doing it with some level of uh, conviction, a, a, a meaningful level of momentum, it doesn't have to be huge because in the in the beginning it won't, but when it does move on risk. That's when we know that risk is the catalyst, and it is strong enough that is influencing this entire curve. It's, in, it's influencing multiple assets, and it is spreading. Okay. We look for this risk theme because it will, once it does show itself, override anything else. We do have a tentative move here for risk, and that's why I want us to be uh, immediately on guard. Now we can see here that the S&P 500 has uh, moved lower. Global equities, Nikkei 225 had a huge drop. German DAX had a huge drop. All right. The yen crosses, not as ready to capitulate just yet. The emerging markets have made a risk move. All right. Interesting. So we have an emerging markets, which is at the very front end of the curve. And you have equity indexes, which are in, I would say, the middle of the curve, or close enough to it, but you don't have the yen crosses. Right? It's not spreading in a deliberate, consistent way. We can also see that the U.S. dollar, as a safe haven currency, is not being bid above all else. That would be a very strong sign that there is a market move towards risk aversion. So what is moving risk? We definitely have to be uh, pay attention to risk, and we have to be aware of its catalysts. Well, the risk theme this morning, we definitely had a number of, uh, of uh, important indicators, and they stirred some volatility, some momentum, but they're not the type that would uh, send the S&P 500 and uh, its global counterparts tumbling. This move is more related to a global perspective, and that global perspective is Ukraine. Ukraine is a uh, very dynamic situation right now, very uncertain situation, and it's leading to a lot of uncertainty uh, and certainly concerns about the stability of uh, a very important region, a bridge, essentially, between the West and East. All right. Ukraine is definitely going to be a continued risk until it resolves itself. Not necessarily going to resolve itself in the best way or, uh, or in the worst way, but the market will remain on hold, concerned about the outcome that it's going to provide until there is something clear. Now Ukraine is a, a situation where you have a, a country in uh, flux. The problem is that this country, uh, which is, ha has political uprisings, is wedged between two uh, very different uh, groups, the Eurozone, or the European Union, and uh, Russia. Both countries 
are looking to take it back into the fold to offer aid, but uh, obviously under their own circumstances. Now, this is leading to some tension between both sides in that they are looking to, they're looking for different power structures to come out of this unsettlement. And this obviously leads to, a, leads to a little bit of a standoff between Russia and the European Union. All right. This standoff leads to dysfunctional financial markets. How significant? Well, it's not necessarily clear. And that, on, that uh, lack of clarity is what really concerns people. How significant will this issue be? When will it be resolved? Will it lead to trade embargoes, trade sanctions between these two large countries? or region, regional economies. And this is a disruption in the financial string that leads to some level of uncertainty. Now it's significant enough that it has stirred a, a, a market correction across all of these global equities when markets have proven themselves very immune to such concerns in the past, especially when we look at something like volatility. We can see in volatility that these markets do not give themselves over easily to uncertainty. Because there's been a lot of uncertainty, not just from uh, Ukraine. There's been a lot of uncertainty from many regions and many economic situations over the past uh, th two months, really, but also you can say the past uh, eight months, really. And the markets continue to deflate their presumptions of uh, risk. Right? This is what these volatility indexes are good for. They tell us what the assumption of risk is. And as you can see, it continues to deflate. We know that uh, between the S&P 500 as a measure of risk and the volatility index, this is the relationship we have. This is the VIX here is flipped upside down. And as you can see, this was the, the trough. Remember, it's flipped upside down. This is the bottom. Uh, of where we had seen the VIX back here in the uh, preceding months and years before the great financial uh, recession. But we are so close to it. There is not much premium left. You can't really work off any more assumption of risk. So when you're this running this thin on risk premium, and risk premium you can see essentially is insurance. This is based on options. Options are used more frequently than not uh, as option uh, to, to insurance to uh, protect against losses on underlying positions. And you can imagine, given that the markets are using records, uh, uh, record amounts of leverage, that you would want some kind of insurance. All right. So the fact that we are so thin on insurance and that the market is so over leveraged, not just in uh, not just in leveraged sense in, in U.S. equities, which are pretty liquid and pretty safe, but also they're still highly exposed to riskier assets like emerging markets and high yield ETFs. All right. This exposure leaves us at risk. And when you have a substantial enough uncertainty like Ukraine, then it highlights and exploits that that lack of uh, stability that uh, people have in their positioning not necessarily in the econ uh, economics and global economics but yes the, there are issues in the uh, economics of the globe and the polit and politics of the globe but there's also instability in the way people are positioned and positioning risks are the kind that are go that can lead to and probably ultimately will lead to a very significant correction now, risk trends are going to be my number one concern this week. I will be looking for anything that can trigger a risk-based move. And Turkey currently holds the banner of those concerns. Another interesting risk-based sentiment can come from China. China has, uh, uh, starting essentially Wednesday morning in Asia, the Chinese National People's Congress. Right, this runs from the 5th to the 15th. The, this is an event where you will see a lot of important uh, speeches and, and updates for what the, uh, fed the central government is planning to do for the economy. You can see that uh, the Premier will give the 2014 GDP growth target. We will also have the budget report for 2014 and we will have the general annual report. Now this is a good time to gauge 
what their plans are. And if their plans are to continue to uh, cut down on or pinch off the shadow banking sector, that means a reduction in credit growth, that means a uh, tapping of the brakes for the regions, the economy's biggest driver. Their biggest driver hasn't been trade. Their biggest driver has not been uh, legitimate uh, domestic demand. Their biggest driver has been investment. All right? Investment. And that investment comes through credit growth. And that is a risky situation that if not maintained or handled properly in terms of reducing the risk and, as well as uh, balanced out with fostering the growth, it can lead to a disorderly situation. So this is another international possibility of a big catalyst of risk trends. It's actually, we've come quite a far away because Russia, Ukraine, China, these countries influencing the bigger web or the bigger picture of risk trends has not happened in a while. Uh, we have, uh, over the past months, talked more about, well, what is... What are the major central banks of the world doing? And what is the U.S. or what is the expectation of U.S. taper? All right, a lot of uh, more developed country discussion back then. Now we're still on that emerging market concern. All right, we just happen now to be talking about two of the biggest BRIC members. All right? So some of these uncertainties keep them readily at hand. Make sure that you're watching the headlines related to these particular developments because they can and will give us some volatility and uh, you don't want to trust any any headlines that suggest that they are anything but the major catalysts. All right, That's the whole point of fundamental analysis to be able to recognize, identify, and trade on the major market themes, the major, major drivers that we have in the market. Right, because that's what moves the market. More importantly, that's what moves it and keeps it moving. Now, those are the major concerns for risk trends, but they won't uh, necessarily give us consistent drive. We've seen a lot of false starts for risk themes over the past uh, weeks, months, and they have failed time and time again to generate consistency and direction. Perhaps we should look away from risk, which is confused and look more towards specific pieces of event risk, specific things, other themes that might be major drivers. So where should we look? Well, I think the EURUSD is going to highlight some of the biggest catalysts or biggest themes that we have this week. The question is whether these themes are influential enough to generate market movement. Now, the Euro side of the thing, all right, we have seen this morning uh, ECB President Draghi testifying in his quarterly economic and monetary policy affairs uh, discussion. And what he said in that theme was that he didn't see any risks of deflation, nor did the IMF, uh, according to what Lagarde said this morning. Uh, but he did warn that a persistent low inflation environment suggests that they, can, they will struggle further to get back up to their target rate. The battle over inflation, or the concern over inflation, as it were, has not really been waged by the central bank. The ECB has allowed its monetary policy, uh, or its uh, balance sheet, to significantly contract. And this is a very, very different uh, approach than many other central banks, most other central banks, of its similar magnitude. We have seen the, Fe the Fed's balance sheet, which you can look at uh, here. The Fed's balance sheet has continued to increase at a pretty hearty pace, all right, well over $4 trillion now. Uh, and we've seen the Bank of Japan, their balance sheet has uh, increased at a pretty, uh, pretty aggressive uh, clip. There's their balance sheet, and that's rising more, at a, looks like an, a more exponential rise here. But the ECB has stood out from the crowd and allowed its balance sheet to actually contract. Now I say allowed its balance sheet, it's not, it's not uh, on purpose reducing it, it is allowing it to shrink because the, the banks, the local banks, have borrowed 
approximately a trillion euros worth of uh, loans, uh, short-term loans, very low yield. They did so under a program called the LTRO and the LTRO2, and they were allowed those loans for three years, but they allowed repayment after one. Those banks started to repay those loans, and in repaying those loans, the ECB's balance sheet has contracted. Let's see if I have the balance sheet. I don't think I do. And as that balance sheet contracts, the ECB is essentially allowing its interest rates to rise. And when its interest rates rise, that's when we have a more appealing currency that provides it something of a yield. Right? And that yield is a considerable driver for interests related to any currency strength. And you can see that the euro has really appreciated against most of its counterparts. All right? A lot of this appetite for the euro, this yield, has come because of this reduction in the balance sheet. Now, as you can imagine, if there's any risk that they are going to increase the balance sheet. That reverts the yield. That also reverts the euro's appeal. Okay, no rhyme intended. That is gonna, that is going to be a concern, and that has been a concern as of late. Uh, we've seen at each of the ECB rate decisions these past months, there has been a lot of speculation going in. Well, this week we happen to have another ECB rate decision on Thursday. All right, this is going to be a very important event risk because by Draghi's own words, he suggested that by March they will have a lot of the, of the data that they need to establish what their uh, direction is going to be on monetary policy. Not surprising that he would say that considering that they, you would presume that they have those uh, necessary materials at each policy decision. But this one has been rendered or suggested to be uh, particularly important. So as traders, we know we need to be watching this pretty closely. What are we looking for? We're looking for any kind of suggestion that the ECB is considering actually increasing stimulus. Right. A rate cut will get a pretty violent reaction from the euro. You would see the euro reverse pretty aggressively because it wouldn't be expected. All right, you'd have a big drop from the euro USD. You'd have a big drop from the euro pound. You'd definitely get a big drop from the euro yen. All right, but they wouldn't be strong follow-through moves. All right, just like we had the rate cut, the last rate cut back in uh, response to the uh, disappointing data uh, in o late October. The actual rate cut was in November. Look what happened. The euro dropped. Yes but it was not able to clear that longer trend line. Right? It was not able to find strong follow-through. It was more of a uh, deflation of those concerns in the lead-up because of data, the co combination of the Eurozone CPI and the Eurozone unemployment. The unemployment rate was at a record high. The CPI figure noted its biggest drop in a long time, I believe, if not Eurozone records. So those concerns culminated in expectations of a rate cut from the ECB, they followed through, but the euro had already priced in much of that. It hasn't priced in anything of that type going into this decision. Okay, At least not yet. Have a couple more days, but it has not priced in a strong probability of a rate cut. But that rate cut itself, lowering the interest rate, is not really a strong option for the ECB. It doesn't really uh, support or generate the kind of return that they need. Already at 0 0.25, the benchmark lending rate, they don't really have much more to cut. There's talk about uh, 10 or 15 basis point rate cuts, uh, which is a possibility. But what does it actually do? Does it encourage more lending? Does it bolster the uh, actual consumption? Does it facilitate economies from recovering from recessions? Does it actually lead to a, re a reversal in employment? It does not necessarily get any closer to the goal that they are looking for than the previous quarter percent rate cut. There. But that being said, they've also suggested, or there's also been discussion of negative uh, deposit rates, which are uh, a different rate other than the benchmark. Uh, these negative deposit rates are supposedly will encourage banks to lend, 
but this is something of a it would be a very substantial uh, experiment. We haven't seen a central bank of that magnitude really take uh, that kind of theme and run with it yet. All right, that would be very, very unusual. But it's always a possibility, so we have to keep it as an option. And believe me, I'll be covering, I'll, I'll dedicate an entire video to this prior to the ECB's rate decision. But really what I'm looking for, and what I think has the greatest potential of generating the most bang for their euro, is going to be a stimulus program. All right, it has to be a targeted stimulus program because that's the same kind of circumstances that helped uh, establish the situation in the past, uh, the, uh, the past uh, go. All right. We've seen a very big drop in stimulus. Now, of course, this is the ECB's balance sheet versus the Fed balance sheet. The Fed's balance sheet continues to rise at a pretty consistent level. The ECB's is just dropping aggressively after that brief period after the crisis started to really entrench in the Eurozone. Uh, and they acted to stabilize the uh, fi uh, the sovereign and the, f the banking sector issues. But if they can help to curb the euro, to help out trade, if they can help to bolster lending by regional banks, if they can help bo uh, boost the capital position of these banks as they're going through their stress tests, the period where they want to hold on to their money, then they can do greater good. Lower lending rates do not necessarily uh, prevent bigger uncertainties, bigger disruptions that come from outside of the euro-based system. What happens if uh, an emerging market uh, situation continues to deteriorate? That's going to hurt the euro. Right? And if that's coupled with the euro still rising, that is certainly a very major concern. Now, as you know, I'm not just a fundamental trader, I'm definitely a technical trader as well. I have very, very substantial technical bearings just up there about 138.50. And as you can see, this is this wedge pattern goes all the way back to 2003. Right? This is a decade's worth of price action. This is a decades long technical pattern. It just so happens to also fit within a couple year technical pattern we had here. This bottom was back in July of 2012 when the uh, central bank, the ECB, introduced a stimulus program that was never activated but always a constant threat, a constant threat of support if need be. But as you can see, big wedge, bigger wedge, all right, and activity levels that suggest we are very likely to see some meaningful volatility. This is the ATR, the average true range, 20 day, which is equivalent to one trading month. And we are at the lowest levels of activity since July 2007. All right, this tells me market conditions, more likely for a breakout. Technical, you have heavy uh, boundaries around us. And fundamentals, we are coming up on the ECB rate decision, which taps into one of the dominant themes for the euro. That's how we combine a more consistent, a bigger, fuller picture of what the markets are that we're dealing with. Right. This is the kind of situation where we can see immediately whether we have the technical breakout aligning itself to the fundamentals, and if they don't, you're probably not going to find fault, or you'll find a false breakout, very much like what we've had with the S&P 500. This is a great reflection of how technicals cannot alone provide us the keys that we need. All right. Technicals, fundamentals, market conditions, all three together. Now, in this Euro USD, of course, it's a Euro USD. We have to consider the other side of the equation, the US dollar, and there's plenty of event risk on the US docket. Starting tomorrow, we have the Senate banking confirmation hearings for Fisher, Bernard, and Powell. All right, three potential central bankers, except for Powell, who is already a central banker, but he's going to be reaffirmed to the position. These three are expected to be on the board, the vote, they'd be voting members of the Federal Reserve. All right, if they get that position, they will be helping to determine taper and potentially even the initial or the eventual Fed rate hike, the first in the regime, because it comes, it has to come eventually. All right. 
This will be particularly important. We want to hear what they have to say. We want to see their positions. We want to see if they're actually going to make it through. All right, this will be very important to inc incorporate into our expectations going forward. It might not necessarily, however, be one of those immediate market movers, All right, so we ha or, or lasting market movers. You might not get a trend because of this, but you'll definitely see uh, potential for volatility. On the other hand, maybe uh, Fisher. Stanley Fisher, who is uh, known for being something of a hawk, if he says something provocative, maybe we do get something uh, more substantial, more significant. All right, there's a possibility the markets are on edge, and if they get uh, if they are pushed over that edge because of monetary policy expectations from incoming central bankers, that could be a catalyst. All right, for those that are not familiar, chaos theory, where you have the or the the butterfly into a hurricane uh, theory where you see a small seemingly isolated event because of the interconnectedness of all these markets and the uh, the links that they have between all these events that we can't even see the links between the markets small see these these small events seem to set off much bigger developments much more catalyzing uh, and progressive trends in market positioning, volatility, risk, right? And that's the kind of thing that we have to watch out for. It's difficult because you never know how small or how large the event has to be and how sensitive the markets are, but at this point, given the volatility and given the uh, inability to actually find meaningful follow-through on on these def definitive themes like risk stream trends, we know that we have to be very very careful of how these things can develop. Now, the confirmation hearing is just the appetizer for the week. The major concern, if we're talking about Fed and monetary policy, is going to be on Friday, all right? And that is going to be non-farm payrolls, all right? Now, as you can see, I don't have non-farm payrolls in red. I have unemployment in red, as it should be. Unemployment and inflation are the ECB, or sorry, the, <laughs> the Fed's primary concerns for monetary policy. All right? When they set interest rates, when they set stimulus targets, they do so based on those two elements. Now we know the employment rate, the unemployment rate, has continuously declined. Now there's a lot of uh, concern about the uh, this trend because a lot of it has uh, developed without the levels of participation, meaning there are just fewer people on the labor uh, pool because they've uh, dropped out, they've been so discouraged about not finding work. Uh, there's also been concerns about uh, the type of employment, all right? maybe the people that are underemployed, they're not working as many hours as they would like. There's also suggestions or uh, concerns about wage growth, all right? which is not uh, showing that same kind of robust employment record. But we know that the Fed's targets are unemployment and inflation, and their uh, uh, target for ending QE was 7%. You know where we're at? 6.6 .6 right now. Their target for uh, potentially discussing rate hikes, this is the targets that, was, that were given to us back last June by then Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, was 6.5%. We're only a tick away from that. And while hitting that 6.5%, if we do, wouldn't necessarily trigger a discussion, an imminent discussion of rate hikes, it does get us on that path. It means that we are making progress. And it does not do us very good to uh, doubt every step of the way the validity of that data because central bankers when they make their policy decisions aren't going to second guess the validity of their data. They're going to act on their data. All right. So it does not do us any good to put on our tinfoil hats and say this data is doctored or this data is not representative or whatever the situation might be. We have to work with what we have, and that's what we have. That's what the central bankers have. Now, of course, they're going to look at the surrounding data. They suggest that, that they are looking at participation, they'll look at wage growth, they'll look at time worked. Those are going to be considerations as well. But this is essentially the leading edge of this data. This is the backbone of this data release. So we need to look at the unemployment rate as being one of the dual, uh, dual mandates of the Federal Reserve. And if we see another downtick from 6.6%, it will not only ensure taper, 
and the consistent path that uh, all of the Fed officials essentially have uh, committed themselves, all the voters have said, yes, we we think that uh, the taper is the way to go, and that we are going to uh, we're going to stick with it unless something very significant changes us off that path. All right, taper is set in uh, set in. That is the gear that they're in. Taper, as we see it confirmed, is not going to give us a lot of market movement because it's already expected to be that way. What we want to see is if we get closer and closer and closer to that first rate hike. All right? And for the U.S. dollar, the interest rate hike, there is a little bit of that already priced in. All right? This is the 12-month interest rate uh, expectations via swaps for the, US, uh, for the Federal Reserve. And as you can see, they're already pricing in a full rate hike. All right, in 12 months. So by March 3rd, 2015, there is some pricing towards rate hike. Now, of course, some of this has to do with uh, the natural yield differentials, but there's also a very substantial influence here from expectations for hikes. All right, this is uh, also a reflection of something of insurance. But at the same time, you can see that taper concerns have backed off. This is the U.S. dollar versus taper search interest, and we take that interest as a reflection of concern or, or market appetite for the theme. And it has definitely backed off. So we are transitioning away from this being a driver, the taper consideration, because realistically we've, we've seen relatively limited reactions from the S&P 500 as a measure of risk to the December 18th taper. All right? Now as an actual taper, risk trend still rose. Then the January 29th, they tapered, and it dropped off, but it didn't really break down, not until later at least. The dollar, similar situation, limited reactions to those tapers. Taper is not going to be as influential. The markets want to see the possibility of rate hikes. There's one of two things that really drive the U.S. dollar. All right, There is the expectations for changes in interest rates and monetary policy, which is a big driver for all of FX. And the other is risk trends. So if we see those themes that we just talked about in terms of Ukraine or whatever the uh, the butterfly uh, wing beats are to set off that uh, torrent of chaos theory, if we see that turn into risk, then potentially we can also have a driver for the U.S. dollar because risk trends are a big driver for the U.S. dollar. This is the FX-based volatility index. And as you can see, its relationship to the U.S. dollar is quite strong. The U.S. dollar and the euro are going to be the biggest uh, fundamental discussions this week. But of course, you can't just isolate your view to, to currencies. I would also warn you to watch out for the Australian dollar in particular. is going to be a big market mover this week. In the upcoming uh, Asia session, we have current account balance for the fourth quarter. We have the RBA rate decision. All right? The market has priced in uh, virtually nothing for rate hike potential for the uh, Australian dollar. And I'm not just talking about over the coming uh, three months or so where nothing is going to happen. I'm talking about going forward for months. They're not really pricing in much at all. And there will eventually be a move, a monetary policy move. And it's very good chance that it's actually a hike. So where do we start to see that uh, suggestion of a hike come in and potentially give the Aussie dollar some ground back? Because it's lost a lot of ground, especially for a carry currency and its performance during a supposedly risk positive market. We've seen a lot of equity gains and the Aussie has declined. All right. This can be one of those events that if it does support the possibility of rate hikes in the foreseeable future, the Aussie dollar has a lot of potential. Not just in the Aussie USD, I am particularly interested in the Euro Aussie, big head and shoulders pattern after a massive in increase. The same thing is true of the pound Aussie with a sloping shoulder line, shoulder uh, neckline. All right, Aussie dollar looks great for its potential and it looks great almost everywhere. So this is gonna be a very interesting currency pair. The RBA rate decision is going to be one of the bigger uh, event risks for it this week, but we also have the uh, GDP figures as well. And it, this is the, I mean, we have more data. I mean, there's data every week, including the trade balance on Thursday morning. So this is going to be a very Aussie intense week. 
watch it not necessarily just for trend, although I'm going to be most interested in that, but also watch it for volatility. Other event risk, uh, and looking at the majors, I'm going to be looking at the pound, although it doesn't have as many market movers or catalysts for the uh, rate expectations related to the Bank of England, that rate forecast is going to be most important. The pound falls right in the middle of the risk spectrum. It's not a safe haven. It's not a risky currency. So if you want to see direction from the pound, especially against something like the U.S. dollar, you need to see something that uh, fosters expectations for uh, the time frame of that rate hike from the first rate hike from the Bank of England. There's still a lot of expectation that it could come before the end of the year. If anything squashes that, that would send the pound tumbling. Anything confirms it, and we have consistent, uh, consistency and potentially a break above 167, 168. All right. Now in terms of data, watch, we had the uh, manufacturing uh, figures this morning. We have service sector activity uh, data coming up a little bit later. And the Bank of England rate decision on Thursday, though that's not necessarily going to be a very mar major market mover, because as we've seen, when they don't make changes, they don't give us any kind of guidance. So the probability that they change their monetary policy is exceptionally low, meaning this event uh, can essentially leave us with absolutely nothing to work with. Of course, on Friday, we do have the 12-month inflation forecasts that are uh, updated by both the Bank of England and GFK, which is a uh, consumer data uh, reporter. So we'll see what they have to say. I'll also be watching the uh, Japanese yen. Monetary policy expectations are very important for the Bank of Japan. We're coming in, uh, once we hit the April, uh, there are actually two rate decisions in April for the Bank of Japan. That's the time frame expected for the upgrade in its open-ended stimulus program. And the Bank of England, or sorry, the Bank of Japan stimulus program at this point is the biggest. Right? Not the total stimulus that they have, but the pace of growth. They have an open-ended QE program. That QE program is growing at a much faster pace than any other central banks out there, and it's expected to increase. That increase is necessary. All right? This is a key catalyst for the yen crosses continuing to the upside. If they do not feed that move, all right, if they don't feed the consistent rise in these yen crosses, which we've already seen, they're starting to back off. All right, this is the dollar yen's performance since November 1st of this past year. This was the November 1st, 2012 performance going into the opening QE program announcement, which is this red line. And as you can see, speculation kept rising, rising, rising. Market is backing off. All right. And they have bigger concerns. They're concerned about what may happen to risk trends. Nikkei 225, if this thing starts to collapse, we're talking about carry trades. Yen crosses are carry trades, and these are carry trades that don't offer any yield and are pretty expensive for what kind of yield they actually do offer. So you need something to drive these things forward. Right? It's becoming more and more difficult to do so. Now in terms of, of catalysts to drive these kind of expectations, not much from Japan. Right? Not this week. We had a lot of uh, event risks last week, and it do, it essentially gave them the kind of mixture necessary to sit on their hands, but the market might not tolerate their mum or status quo approach. If the Nikkei 225 starts to make a drop all right, and show that we have a risk aversion move, look at the relationship that the Nikkei 225 has to yen crosses. I'll be on the lookout for pairs like dollar yen, but more importantly, I like pound yen at one, uh, 169, euro yen down here at 139, 138. Right? If they make moves, we have much bigger potential in these pairs. All right, All right we'll wrap it up there. We went over, but uh, I had to cover these themes. These are important themes. Monetary policy and risk trends continue to be our key catalysts, All right, our key trend developers. And we must keep a very good eye on them. We have to know what is moving, what is market moving for that theme, and that will put us in the best possible position to analyze our markets on a fundamental basis. All right? But never, ever take fundamentals alone. Always combine fundamentals with technicals and market conditions, and that will give you the more complete picture on pairs like EURUSD. All right? 
I'll wrap it up here, but tomorrow I will be doing the Q&A back in Daily FX Plus. I'll answer all the market strategy trading based questions that I can within the hour we have allotted. So hopefully you come and join me then. If you uh, do come around, make sure you ask those questions early because I take them first come first serve. All right. So good luck trading this week and I uh, hope to see you all back here when we speak in this particular form next week, same time, same place.